bad mistake, big mistake. <laughs> completely underestimated the challenges, completely overestimated myself. Um, and I think one of the things which I am still um, uh, grappling with is getting back control of my own time. I think when you have to run your own firm um, uh, and, and you do not have the shared resources of a large organization behind you, um, you have to be either a lot more creative um, or you've got to work a lot harder. Hi, I'm Shulin, here to inspire you on the infinite possibilities after the bar. I'm very excited to have this guest on the show because it's the first time we have a senior counsel here with us. He's here to share his varied experience from some of his high-profile cases and how his definition of success has evolved over the years. He's none other than Lok V. Ming. So V. Ming shot to fame for the Silk Air case when he led the defence for our beloved Singapore Airlines. He's also known for the Slim Tan case when he defended Rayson Tan, a local celebrity. He defended him successfully. So prior to founding his own firm, LVM Law Chambers, V Ming practiced in Rodak and Davidson for 30 years, rising to the position of senior partner. Asked to describe himself in three words in an interview article, he said, never say never. Welcome, Viming, to After the Bar. Thanks for coming onto the show. My pleasure, Shulin. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, finally you agreed. Because when I first asked you, you were hesitant. But finally you said yes, so I'm very happy and thankful. I'm not quite sure what kind of traps you have in place for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but first of all, congratulations on winning the CC Tan Award. So the CC Tan Award is awarded to lawyers who display the highest ideals for the legal profession. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, that came as a real surprise uh, for me when I first uh, had a message from my friend Greg Vijendran that they were awarding me the CC Tan Award. My first thought was that his phone was hacked. <laughs> I was in court at that time. I had to wait till the mid-morning break in the court proceedings uh, and then called him and asked him whether his phone was okay. And he says, <laughs> yes, my phone is all right, you know, and we're giving you the award and that's for real. Wow. Uh, so, so it's a real surprise. Wow, and I'm very wow. grateful for that. Yeah, amazing. And what I really personally love about V Ming, I, I want to share, is that despite all your success as a senior counsel, you really have no airs. You know, from the, from the very first time I, I spoke with you to meeting you. And I want to read what Lisa Sam wrote. Lisa Sam is from the Law Society. So she wrote, and I feel like she really captured your essence. So for those who don't know you yet, okay, she said, For all of us who know V Ming in practice, he is known to possess an extremely disarming, sometimes downright charming and non-confrontational personality, but maintains a disciplined demeanour, ethical, tenacious and pragmatic approach to practice. In many ways, he personifies the value celebrated by the CC Tan Award. So my question is, were you always like this? Were you always so charming? You know, <laughs> or, or, or is it something like your personality sort of evolved over the years? I think uh, you can and have to be confrontational when the situation calls for them. But it's always sometimes good uh, to try to be reasonable, uh, try to appear uh, sensible and constructive in discussions with the other side, because that can be quite disarming. So I, <laughs> I, I, I hope to think uh, that um, the skills which I have um, to be able uh, to solve issues laterally to be able to involve the other side um, in uh, dispute resolution um, is a weapon uh, that I, I, I hope I have deployed uh, quite successfully over the years yeah. as well. Yeah, I'm sure you have. You are senior counsel. So can I ask, senior counsel in Chinese, is it called Gao Ji Lu Shi? Is it? 对, Gao Ji Lu Shi. Yeah, because my parents say, you know, Gao Ji Lu Shi. So in my parents' generation, if someone is a Gao Ji Lu Shi, it's like a really, really big deal. So my question next is actually, when you first got the news that you made senior counsel, what was your first thought? Who did you first call? Well, let me, let me try to recall. When was events. this? How old were you? Um, this was in December 2014. So that's almost 18 years ago today. Wow, 2004, is it? Oh yeah, 2004. 2004. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, yeah. So it's December 2004. 18 now, years ago. Okay. That's almost 18 years today. Now yeah. I can rem remember I wasn't feeling that well. Uh, that morning and I received a call uh, from the Singapore Academy of Law 
uh, telling me that uh, I've been appointed uh, a senior counsel and that there is one other uh, appointee uh, that year. I, I, I asked uh, him who it was and I said, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Oh. you know? But as it turned out later on, it was uh, Justice Vinod Kum Kumaraswamy wow, okay. uh, who was also appointed that year. Um, but I was not feeling well. I think I was running a fever. Oh, no. um, so I, I called my wife um, uh, As to you tell should. her about it. Yes. Yeah, and then I went home and, and tried to sleep off the fever. Now, when I woke up after a couple of hours, I was just wondering to myself, did I dream all this up? <laughs> did I really get a call from the Singapore <laughs> Academy of Law? And I called my wife. Did I call you a couple of hours back? And she says, yeah, you called me and told me that you have been appointed senior counsel. Um, and so I, 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 I guess, you know, that it must be true. Um, uh, that again is a surprise. Was it everything that you had been working towards? Because every litigator I know, their dream, almost every litigator, their dream is to make SC, senior counsel. So when you did it, do you feel like, yes, you know, my, it's like an acknowledgement of all my efforts? You know, Shulin, I've got to tell you, is probably more of a relief uh, than uh, a sense of overwhelming achievement. Um, uh, that, that wasn't the first time that I uh, uh, applied for senior counsel and got it. Uh, I actually applied a couple of times. So for those of, uh, uh, those of you um, who are thinking of applying uh, to be senior counsel, uh, don't be disappointed if you don't get it the first time round. So you got it the third time round? Uh, I it? think it's about the third time. Ah, yeah, okay. the third time. So never say never, right? Never say never, yeah. And I wanted to give up actually, you know, by the third time, but uh, a very good colleague of mine uh, just kept on encouraging me and, you know, he, he, he sneaked off uh, the office one day, mm -hmm. went to the Supreme Court, uh, took the application form from me, filled up everything oh, wow. um, and, and paid uh, the application fee. Uh, and said that, look, you know, uh, Viming, I think you really need to do this. Can you uh, share who this colleague is? Um, well, I can I can tell you, it's uh, my colleague Hui Chong, oh, okay. uh, who is now uh, an in-house counsel right, right. Uh, with NUS. Yeah. Uh, so he's a good friend, and, and he did it for me, and, yes. and um, I'm grateful to him for yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. I met him that day at your, oh, yes, at yes, your dinner. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, mm. great. And... After making SC, what was the biggest difference, other than your charge-out rates? <laughs> <laughs> what was the biggest difference that you made in your career? Um, I, I think the weight of expectations um, initially um, were the main bugbear for me. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, when you come into a room um, and uh, clients are um, poring over a particular question that's vexing, your, vexing them and vexing your colleagues, um, all eyes will be on you um, as if you will be, somehow be able to pull the rabbit out of the bag and come up with a solution that nobody could think of. Um, that, I think, was, was uh, something which was um, uh, quite difficult to deal with at first. And I think I need to work that off, you know, to mm. say that I, I need not place uh, unreasonable expectations on myself. Uh, but it also reminds me that I have to go into situations and meetings fully prepared because mm. the expectations will always be there no matter what. Mm. Um, and the, the other thing that has changed uh, for me, um, of course, uh, is that um, the expectations in court, I think when judges look at uh, oh. you and, and with the arguments you have to make, uh, um, the expectations of uh, clients and, and also of opponents as well. Oh, yes. right? um, you just can't shoot off any argument that comes oh. into your head. Wow. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, that the expectations would have gone up tremendously. Right. Yeah, yes. okay. And, and I, I'm curious, if, let's say in an alternate universe, if you did not make SE, let's say, or your, your, your friend, your colleague did not submit the application, do you think your career tra trajectory would have still been the same? Like, basically, I'm asking, would you still have done and achieved everything that you did? Well, it's hard to uh, extrapolate that, you know, but what I wanted to be... Um, when I got the senior counsel appointment, uh, was to remain the same person. Mm. You know, I, 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 I think in terms of work expectations, um, uh, that will have to change. But I think in terms of um, the person that I am and the person that I want to be, um, I was determined not to let the appointment uh, change me in any way. Mm. Um, and um, I, I'm not quite sure if I've succeeded in that entirely, um, but that was something which I set out to do uh, and which is still um, foremost in my mind even yeah. at this point in time. Yeah, okay, mm. that's very heartwarming. And, and 
are you willing to share what are those values that you hold very dear to your heart, like the kind of person that, that you hold out to be? Um, I, I think that the, the few val of the values which are important are firstly, um, we must always uh, uh, try to be grateful, mm. you know, for circumstances and for people. I think gratitude is uh, usually a starting point uh, for um, maintaining good relationships, uh, mm -hmm. recognizing that uh, other people have brought something into your life or into your career. Uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's one. Uh, there must also be a willingness to learn. You know, mm. I don't think that uh, we have reached a situation where um, we, we know everything there is to know. Yep. And I know that there are a lot of things I, 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 I really am grappling with, even mm. the fundamentals. And, and just going paperless in my office, for instance, right, trying to harness uh, the use of technology. Man, I tell you what, I, I, I really <laughs> admire my younger colleagues. And, and just now, a short while ago, I mean, yes. just trying to get past uh, the security over here. Yes, uh, yes. Your crew just taught me a thing or two. Yes, yes, indeed. I also learned something new. Can you sing past now? Yeah, can you sing past? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. And, you know, in uh, just now I was in introducing you and I mentioned that you said, never say never. So that's like a motto of yours, is it? Does that apply to you in, in your law career? I think it applies to me, not just in my law career, but in, 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 in my other roles in life, in relationships, um, in sorting up even small issues at home. Mm. Uh, there is usually um, a simple answer to quite a few things, you know, uh, but there are some more complicated, more sophisticated questions and challenges. Uh, mm. You just need a little bit more time to think through it, but never mm. give up. There mm. is always a solution. There's always a way out. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. Uh, we're going to discuss a couple of your high-profile cases, if you're okay with that. Um, let, let, let me try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this year apparently is Silk Air's 25th year anniversary. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes. It's 25 years since yes. that, that, that horrific tragedy. Yes, yeah. the horrific tragedy. So I'm going to share with the listeners. Mm -hmm. So the Silk Air Flight 185 was a scheduled international passenger flight from Jakarta to Singapore that crashed into the Musi River on 19 December 1997, killing 104 people. All 97 passengers and 7 crew on board. So, Viming here, you represented Singapore Airlines for this case. Can you tell us how it felt for you looking back on that case 25 years ago? It was, I mean, I can imagine it must have been a stressful period because there's so much media attention and it's a very high-stakes case. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Um Pretty um, unforgettable, you know. Uh, um, I, I first heard about the news of uh, uh, this air jet that went missing. I believe it was on Friday night. Um, I had just driven my mum back home, back to her home. She joined me for dinner that evening. It was a Friday evening. I remember the afternoon, dark clouds, you know, very, very dark clouds. Um, and I was just coming home uh, after dropping off my mum. Uh, there was uh, Larry Lai, I think, uh, who was the uh, DJ uh, on radio. And he made this announcement, and, and it, it just said that, well, it appears that we may have lost um, contact mm. with the Silk Air jet. And we'll bring you more news of that uh, as we receive them. I, I got home, I, I called out to my wife. I said, dear, you know, uh, we may have lost uh, a Silk Air jet. My wife was working with Singapore Airlines at that time. Um, so we stayed glued uh, to the radio for uh, more information and, and, and then as the hours went on into the evening, uh, we realised that uh, the, the bad news is true and that uh, a jet had gone missing, MI15. The next morning, I, um, I went into the office. In those days, we still worked Saturdays, <laughs> all right? So I got into the office and, um, and there was a message on my phone and it was a message from Mr. Philip Best from Beaumont and & Son, and they were um, uh, solicitors specializing in aviation insurance. Yep. So Philip left this, me this message, and, and it went something like this to say that, look, uh, Viming, by now, I'm sure you would have read news of um, the um, tragedy of MI-185. Um, I'm on my way now, you know, uh, uh, to Palembang, but I shall be grateful if you could go to uh, the library uh, and read up everything that you can on aviation crashes. That's how much I knew about aviation crashes. So I went down to NUS Law Library. I could only find two books, both fictions uh, on aviation crashes. Fiction. Yeah, fiction. 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 Oh my gosh. On aviation crashes. Um, so uh, not very much uh, to, to, to go on. Um, and I could only just wait for the next call from Philip Best. 
Um, but that that was the background uh, to wow. the degree of preparation or preparedness that we have uh, for a case like this. Uh, you asked me whether this was a time of intense pressure for me. Uh, uh, I think we, we can say that it was fairly intense at that point in time. Uh, and for me, my wife was heavily pregnant. She was into her eighth or ninth month of pregnancy. My daughter was born just shortly three and a half weeks uh, after this tragedy. So uh, there were a lot of very powerful and intense conflicting emotions uh, within mm. me. On the one hand, looking forward to the birth of my daughter. Mm. On the other hand, having to deal with families that have just gone through this heavy tragedy. Wow. Wow. So it's contradicting um, and uh, the interposition, you know, of um, the two ends uh, of the human emotions dealing with life and death uh, mm. were especially powerful yeah. and at times quite disturbing for me. Yes, yes. Right. And you know, uh, Viming, I thanks for inviting me previously when you spoke at your church. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how did your faith bring you through this period? Because... You know, you were recently interviewed in Salt and Light, and I know you're very open, you know, you talk about your faith. I imagine, you know, you have to face life and death. I did not even think for a moment that you had to deal with the families, actually. Mm -hmm. so, so how did your faith uh, bring you through? Well, I think if there's one thing my faith has taught me um, is that um, every life has a dignity. Uh, and every life lost um, is one life lost too many. Uh, I, I remember telling my team uh, that, um, guys, I think we have the honor and the privilege uh, of having conduct of the first aviation crash uh, in Singapore. So let's remember this and let's do it right. Um, we had to first issue a questionnaire, you know, to um, uh, the families um, uh, that, that uh, had lost uh, uh, their members on the flight. And I believe, if I recall correctly, it's nine or ten pages of questionnaire and just to make sure, you know, that we uh, give money and pay the right amount uh, of interim payments, you know, to the right people. But many of them were already dealing with grief. And to have them, you know, to uh, detail their relationships, um, you know, brings back memories yes. um, of the people, of the loved ones that they have lost. Um, and, and so we had a lot of calls, um, some irate, uh, some were very helpless, uh, many were just simply crying and just asking us what to do. And we had to deal with quite a number of those calls in a very compressed uh, time period. And we had to have both um, an exercise of restraint, patience, uh, try to be helpful. And, um, and, and how do we sustain all of this? And I told my guys, that we've always have to remember that what we're dealing with, the inconvenience is only transient, but what these families have lost um, is forever. Uh, so we just have to remember, you know, that we we got to try to help them yes. whichever way we can. And mm. that will perhaps make it easier for us, you know, to deal with the paperwork mm. and with the phone calls that we're going non-stop mm. round the clock for the mm. first two two and three weeks yes. two, two to three weeks after the the disaster yes and bearing in mind those were the days without emails mm -hmm. no whatsapp no sms so it was all phone calls and i suppose yes. physical letters yes I, were... I i i had um uh one of the young widows you mm -hmm. know coming to my office with her boss and the the, the boss says well you know Mr. Lok, um, is there anything that your clients can, can do for uh, my colleague? And I said, well, what is there that you would like us to do? And it says that, well, you know, money would be very useful. I mean, she's very young. Um, now she's got to bring up this kid all alone, you know, um, without any foreseeable help for the time being. I says, well, I can, I can understand that, but what, 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 what sort of money are, are, are you looking at? Mm -hmm. I says, well, perhaps a million dollars. I said, no, I, I think that's too much. You know, I, I, I don't think um, we can pay a million dollars and I think that's too much. And, and he looked at me and says that, how, how can you say it's too much? I mean, this lady, she's in her early 20s. She's married for less than a year. 
child is, you know, just a month or two old, you know, and um, it's a long life ahead. She's lost everything. She's lost all the hope she's got at this point in time. How can you say a million dollars is too much? And I just looked at him and, you know, I just went speechless, speechless. Yeah, mm. There's nothing I could say to him. Mm. Wow, that must have been so hard. It was difficult. Yeah, yeah, it was difficult. But we, we, we learned quite a few things at the end of the day. We, we, we learned that um, uh, there are losses, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which were suffered, mm -hmm. which can't perhaps be adequately compensated. But the posture that we take, mm. um, I think, would be quite important. Mm. I remember on the starting day of the hearing, uh, the uh, counsel for the claimants uh, uh, said something to the effect that you know you uh, Yona, you can imagine this would have come as quite a shock um uh, to everybody you know especially to the families right the 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 loved ones uh left that afternoon you know um in their business suits um carrying their bags and they would come back you know remains in empty cans oh or, 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 or 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 tins yeah um so I, I, I told my clients um, that the amount of compensation, let's leave it to the courts to decide what is fair. Mm. But I think as an organization, um, let's realize and acknowledge that the families have suffered a big loss. And the chief executive of Silk Air agreed with me and came down to the hearing on one of the mornings and personally shook the hands the family members who were there and sent um, his condolences and sympathies to the family. Mm. And I think that that sent a very powerful message yep. to the family members. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because they feel hurt and they feel that their loss is being acknowledged. Yes, mm. which I think would be an important part in the journey towards closure mm. for many of the family members. Mm. I don't think till today they would have completely moved on. It still lives on in their memory. But I think the way, I mean, the posture, like you said, the way that you all handled it, it sounds like you all got it right. Hopefully, yeah. Mm, but mm. I, I, I think every small step would count. Yes, every bit counts. Mm. Every touch point is important. Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Mm. Okay, wow, well, that was um, pretty intense. I'm going to move on to the next case, a very high-profile case as well, the Slim Tan Saga, which most of us might have heard. So it involved a number of people who were diagnosed with adverse health effects after consuming weight loss pills that contained prohibited ingredients. Among them were our local celebs. So actor Rayson Tan, your client, he had sold sil Slim Tan pills to his colleague, actress Andrea De Cruz, who later suffered liver failure. And you represented Rayson Tan and the suit against him by Andrea De Cruz, and it was subsequently dismissed by our courts. How did you manage to focus on this despite the media frenzy, you know, the media circus, I would say. And I, I, by chance, I met Rayson Tan once in church because he was, oh, sharing, you did? Yeah, he was sharing his <laughs> testimonial. And he mentioned about how, you know, he owes everything to a Ta Lu Si. And I never knew that that Ta Lu Si, that senior lawyer is you until you, you shared with me over lunch. Yes, yep. yes, mm. yes. I, I, well, I, um, I, didn't start uh, with, uh, well, Rayson didn't start with me um, uh, from the beginning of his case. Um, he switched over to me, I think about maybe three or four months uh, before the commencement of his case. Um, and I told him, Rayson, I, I need to pray about this, all right? And, and, um, and ask God whether, you know, I could value add to your case and take on the case. And after I sought God about, uh, on, his, on his case. Um, I told Rayson, you know, that, okay, I, I, I can take it on. And so we reviewed the case. We amended his defense. Uh, we had to do, to do quite a number of things, all right, to get this case uh, um, ready, you know, for, yes. for trial. So, so that kept me in focus, you know. Uh, I, I was also quite, uh, quite uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, this was going to be built as a Channel 5 versus Channel 8 fight, you know. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. yes, because, that's true. Because Andrea and Pierre were mostly in uh, Channel 5 programs, mm, mm, uh, mm. The, the English channel, yes. e English-speaking channel. And Rayson and Li Ping mm. uh, were ch uh, Channel 8 stars. Yes. Right? So, so I think uh, we knew that this was going to be uh, a Channel 5 and Channel 8. Oh, okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. I remember once walking out of uh, the Supreme Court after one of the uh, hearings for that day, 
and uh, there was a car that was just passing us by, you know, um, just outside the Supreme Court building. Mm-hmm. And the car slowed down, and uh, the passengers wound down the, the windows, and then they, 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 they came up, uh, I mean, they, they stretched their hands out, gave me the thumbs up uh, sign, and said, Jia Yu, Lu Shu, Jia Yu. Oh my <laughs> so God. I was out there. <laughs> there goes uh, another Channel 8 uh, <laughs> <laughs> a follower. Okay, so cute. And actually, it's a bit unusual that you would represent um, an individual, isn't it? Um, I, well, uh, yes and, 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 and no, I, I think it's important. I think yes. it's important to, 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 to represent uh, individual clients from time to time. Yeah. You know, where mm-hmm. uh, you are up close and personal with both your clients as mm-hmm. well as, you know, how they interact with the law. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Reason uh, came to us because um, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, mm-hmm. Norman, you know, um, uh, was doing oh, quite Norman. a number. Yeah, so Norman. So if Norman's Hope. listening to this, well, I hope thanks he is. to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 he was doing quite a number of yes. quite a lot of work, mm-hmm. you know, for Rayson's colleagues. I see. Mediacorp. Okay, and um, I'm curious because Rayson shared that he was so thankful to you. So I imagine that he thought that the chances of him winning the case were low. Can you talk us through, you know, what happened? Well, Rayson was under tremendous stress at that time. Uh, the trial commenced, um, I think, uh, right on the nose of the first birthday of his son, Xavier. Oh. Yeah, so so he had, again, these emotions of um, not knowing what's going to happen uh, at the trial and then wanting to celebrate the first birthday uh, of his son. Um, so he was under a lot of, uh, was under a lot of pressure. Um, but I told Rayson that win or lose, um, we just leave the result to God, you know, but um, I will pray with him. Mm. I will pray with him uh, every day, you know, and even when Rayson uh, was on the stand, you know, we're not allowed to speak to uh, our clients, you know, when yeah. they're on the stand, but I, I asked for permission to see whether I could uh, pray with Rayson, you mm-hmm. know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, before he takes a stand at the start of the day and after the lunch break. Um, I was given permission to do so. And I remember just right outside the, 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 the courtroom on one of these afternoons, I was praying with Rayson. And when I said, Amen, and opened my eyes, the judge was in front of us. He was looking at us and said, what are you doing with me? I said, no, uh, Your Honor, I'm not talking to each other. We're talking to God. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's so endearing. Hey, so, uh, Viming, you know, when we had lunch, you shared with me about the cross-examination of Andrea de Cruz. And I remember that left such a deep impression because you gave her a very hard time. Can you share more about the cross-examination? Well, um, it's been quite a few years. I, I, I can't remember the specific questions, but I, I, I did remember cross-examining both uh, Pierre uh, as well as Andrea. Now, there's this bit about uh, the cross-examination of Pierre. Yes. Pierre was an uh, absolute gentleman. And of course, he was very articulate as well. I remember at the end of the cross-examination of Pierre, I looked at him and I told him this. I said, Mr. Peng, Many of the questions that you gave to my, many of the answers that you gave to my questions over the over the course of today, I think uh, were answers um, that you scripted to help the plaintiff. All right, and I'm not happy with that. But there's something else which I need to tell you. That you have courage, and you have the conviction and the love you which you acted out when you donated half of your liver to the woman you love. And for that, I got to give you my respect. And after I said that, I was sure I saw eyes of Pierre well up. But I got to respect that man, mm. you know, for his courage and for what he sacrificed to Andrea. Yes. Now, I'm not quite sure exactly what effect I had or my cross-examination questions had on Andrea. But uh, years later, I uh, had the occasion of bumping into Andrea and Pierre uh, at the restaurant. And I was telling my wife, I said, hey, that lady over there looks like Andrea de Cruz. <laughs> Maybe I should just go over and just say hello to her. And my wife says, I hope you're not going to cause any trouble over <laughs> here in this restaurant. So I says, no, I don't think so. So I, 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 I went over and I tapped her on the shoulder. She was, the back was to me. And when she turned around, I says, Hi, Andrea, did, did you remember me? 
and says, of course I do. You are the kick-ass lawyer, you know. And, you know, I, I, you know, how are you? And, you know, you're a real kick-ass lawyer. And I tell my friends that if they ever need another um, lawyer, you know, to give you a call. And, you know, it's so many years later and mm. Andrea looks so good, mm. you know, and mm. I'm really she so glad. Does. Yeah, she, 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 she looks so good. And, 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 you know, she was healthy. Mm. Um, and recently I bumped into Pierre again mm. um, at the wedding of uh, Jeffrey and Felicia Chin. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, uh, two of them are getting on fine. Uh, yes, so I'm yes. so happy for yes. In fact, like, I think the whole of Singapore just thought... You know, they only wanted the best for Andrea and they all respected what Pierre did for, for Andrea. Yes. So it's, it's, it's amazing. They're thriving, they're doing well. And you know what happened to, to everyone was not something that anyone wanted. No one had expected that. Yeah. yeah. And, and what Pierre did, mm-hmm. um, I must say, is not something that any guy off the street would have been able yep. to, to, to do. Yep, right? yep, and and sure. he had to do so in a... Really mm. under um, rather urgent circumstances. Yes, you know, I yes, don't think yes. have very much time to think. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And and are you still in touch with uh, Rayson and Li Ping? I still am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we we actually all met at Felicia and Jeffrey's oh, wedding okay. uh, uh, um, about a month and a half, two okay, months ago. Okay. Uh, so mm. Rayson was there, and uh, Pierre was there, and uh, mm. you know we, we 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 all had the chat, and I took photographs with them. Mm-hmm. It's so nice that uh, I guess in your legal work you have impacted positively Rayson's life because from what I remembered from what he shared during his testimonial was like he thought you know his his career was over his life was over and well fortunately well it's not far from it yeah well I'm mm. grateful that mm. things turned out well you know yeah. for him then and um and and he's gone on mm-hmm. you know to achieve greater things in his career as well and Li Ping we all know you yep. know has um, has achieve so much yes. in, in her own career. Yeah. Um, their son, I think, may be thinking of a legal career as well. Really? So, so, so he's going to apply to LVM Law Chambers? <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure whether he has even bigger aims and, and goals uh, in life. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad you know, oh, that wow, things amazing. have turned out uh, okay and that um, uh, Rayson's interaction with me has uh, had positive yes. Uh, consequences. Yes, yes, he talks about you regularly. Okay, okay, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about overcoming challenges because I think now that we've talked about these two cases, there are, there's this thing about doing things right by a client and also doing the right thing. Have you had to navigate moral grey areas before? And, you know, for the listeners out there, it would be very illuminating, I think, for them to hear from you because you've had 30 over years of experience. You know, could you shed some light on that? Um, yes, actually, people ask me this question all the time. I mean, um, do you have to, do you ever had to deal or act for clients uh, whom you know are guilty or um, uh, who are not telling the truth? Um, yes, we've got, I've, I, I've been in such situations before, and I'm quite sure almost every lawyer in town would find himself in that situation. I think it is important that you settle in your own heart. Um, what sort of values you want to have Mm -hmm. so that whenever you're confronted with such situations, you just would know what to do and you do not have to rethink all over again. And I think, again, the values of just wanting to do what is right, being able to look at yourself in the mirror and to be proud, you know, of Mm -hmm. what you stand for. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you're religious, you know, um, that you will be able to give a good account of yourself and what you have done with your life, you know, uh, before your maker and creator. Mm. I think those are all important. Yeah, well said. And starting your own firm, LVM Law Chambers, not to be confused with LVMH, (laughs) (laughs) but I must say your branding, everything is very impressive. Well, it was was suggested to me. uh, Maybe I should have invited Michael Huang. (laughs) (laughs) And then we would have made a strong case for LVMH. Yeah, LVMH. (laughs) So starting your own firm versus being a senior partner in a big firm, you grew from six lawyers to now over 30 lawyers. Almost about 30 lawyers now. Which is incredible, incredible what, five years, right? It's been five years? Uh, five, about six years, yes. Six years, mm. yes. And I mean, I must congratulate you, first of all, on your tremendous success. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask what made you have the courage to step out of your comfort zone? Because it's 30 years in the same firm and the safe confines. And then 
sort of being an entrepreneur, you know, suddenly uh, in your 50s, I would say, what, what made you, what, what, was there a trigger or something? Well, I, I, when I first told my wife that, uh, dear, I think I would like to go out and start my own practice. And she looked at me and said, what's come, what's come to you? Why do you want to do that? And I told her, I think I want to take back control of my own life. Mm. Bad mistake, big mistake. <laughs> completely underestimated the challenges, completely overestimated myself. Um, and I think one of the things which I am still um, uh, grappling with is getting back control of my own time. I think when you have to run your own firm um, uh, and, and you do not have the shared resources of a large organization behind you, um, you have to be either a lot more creative um, or you got to work a lot harder. Yes. Right. So yes. so um, yeah. Yeah. I'm still I'm still trying to work that out. <laughs> <laughs> I can empathize because I think we all have this rose colored vision goggles when we're thinking, oh, it'd be really nice to be our own boss, only to realize, wow, mm. you know, seven days nonstop, twenty four seven, no boundaries. But I mean, you you must be proud of yourself. You should be proud of yourself because you know there are so many lawyers. I saw the group of lawyers at the Law Society dinner. They all look like they're full of conviction, passion for what they do. And I see some of your associates. They they regularly post on LinkedIn about how amazing the culture is. So okay. you you should you should give yourself kudos. Oh yeah, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful for all of that, Julian. Um, I, you know when someone applies to the firm, and I ask them, you know, um. Why? Why do you want to join LVM? I mean, we are we are not a large firm. We do not have a uh, a long history be behind us. Of course, some of them are very nice and say, "Well, you know, Mister Lok, I heard some good things about you and I and and about your firm, and you know, I would want to try out with you." But uh, a couple of them, I think, um, uh, maybe just want to work in a smaller setup and and maybe mm. uh, shun you know uh, the anonymity you know uh, that may be associated with uh, a larger firm. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there's one thing I always tell them, that if you are ready for an adventure, all right, our firm is still young. I'm looking for people to come in and help shape the practice that mm. we are building over here. Mm -hmm. all right? um, and it is an adventure. Mm. All right? Because years later, if you are still with the firm and we've managed to create something that's significant and making significant contributions, both to society as well as to the legal profession, you can look back and say, Wow, that was an adventure. Yes. And I was part, you know, of yes. building up this this practice. Now, if you want that, and if that excites you, come join us. Wow, this right. has become a recruitment advertorial <laughs> for LVM Law. But I must also say, I'm very impressed with Joseph, your number two. And Joseph has been with you for so many years. Yeah, Joseph mm. Joseph is a great guy. Yeah, you know, one yeah. of the smartest uh, colleagues I've worked with, you mm. know, over the last 30, 35 yes. years. Yes, yes. Um, and if Joe wasn't working with me, um, in Rodike um, years ago, I wouldn't have entertained this thought of mm. coming out. Also, it was yeah. him. I, I, I think you. I, I needed a strong number two. Okay. I needed someone uh, with the same set of values, um, and uh, and he's smart. Mm -hmm. He's hardworking. Mm. Um, and he's better looking than me. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's also charming. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so tell us how you feel about this next generation of lawyers. Because we hear so many things, more negative than positive. And each generation always thinks that things are, used to be better in their era. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm no exception. Um, and I'm a firm believer though that there's so much we can learn cross generations. Um, so, how do you think this next generation of lawyers differs from, from previous generations? Um, actually, I'm a great admirer of the new generation as well. Uh, they, they are smart, okay? And young people always have a lot of energy and they've got You ideas. have a lot of energy yourself. Oh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think it pales uh, compared with uh, what my colleagues have. Um, but um, what this new generation have in greater abundance than what I had in my generation is that they have more options. Mm. There are more choices in life. Uh, in my generation, if you make it to university in your family, we can't assume that every sibling in that family would be able to get a tertiary education. Mm -hmm. I mean, qualification is one thing, but the financial capability of that family to support two or three 
uh, of the children into university is something else. So when you come from a background like that, and you make it to law school, and you graduate, it's very tough to tell your parents. After everybody has made the sacrifice to put in, you into law school and to get you the law degree, to say, Mom, Dad, I'm done with legal studies. I now want to go and tour the world and get more experiences in life. I mean, in those days, it is quite difficult when you realize that the rest of the family members have made sacrifices for you. But the makeup of you know the families these days are quite different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are less kids, mm. you know, and they are better off, and there are options. And with options, I guess people don't really need to tough it out, right? Every time bosses make unreasonable demands, all the profession make un un unreasonable demands. Um, you can have a choice whether to tough it out, you know, um, see what else uh, mm -hmm. there might be available outside and try something else. Um, but I've got to say that uh, my younger colleagues, um, uh, they are tenacious um, if the situation calls for them to be tenacious. Uh, they can certainly keep the long hours. Um, but they also expect to be treated fairly with dignity and to be recognized mm. for their contributions. Yes, and to be respected, right? I Absolutely. think that's a, that's a big hallmark. Absolutely. Yes. I think it's important for us to not trivialize the younger lawyers' concerns because I think it's so easy to just dismiss it and say, ah yeah, strawberry generation. Mm. I've heard it too often. Mm. And yes, I used to work really long hours when I was an associate. I still work long hours. Um, and sometimes when I say, well, this is how it should be, this is the rite of passage, I get pushed back from the younger ones to say, you know, Shunen, don't impose what you think should be done on us. Times have changed. And I, I, I'm still coming to terms with that, to be honest, Viming. Mm. It's, it's still an area of struggle because I still believe everyone, whatever industry you're in, you need to put in the hours. Mm. There, there's no shortcuts, basically. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think because the young, they are better traveled than we are. Mm. Uh, they are exposed to different cultures, different people. Um, and I... I think to them, uh, what is important is that there is a world to be discovered outside. There are cultures and there are languages and societies, you know, to be experienced, you know, and to be learned. Mm. Uh, in my generation, I don't think we think so much in terms of the world out there to be discovered, mm -hmm. you know. Definitely not the yeah. world to be conquered, yeah, you know. Yeah. But back home, there is a career, you know, uh, to be launched, you know, and then there cases is a family to, to main yeah, cases to be fought and the family to maintain. Yes, yes. I, I, I think we are shaped and dictated more by practical concerns. Mm -hmm, mm. Um, and uh, I think the younger generation maybe are motivated uh, somewhat more by aspirational objectives. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, I can't mm -hmm. say that that is wrong. Yeah. Because you have to have aspirational objectives, mm -hmm. you know, um, which will spawn ideas, creativity, you know, and then to have the extra spark to release the extra burst of energy, mm -hmm. you know, to go and achieve something which you ordinarily would not mm. do. Yes. So I'm going to ask you something more controversial because you're you are describing oh someone. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're describing someone who's going on a gap year, traveling the world. So I, I came from a middle class background and I remember when I was, um, I, I first started out in recruitment, there was a partner in one of the big four law firms. She told me, you know, Shulin, I always look at the address on the CV. If the person stays in a HDB flat, I'll interview. Person stays in landed house, forget it. Rich parents will quit, you know, at the drop of a hand. <laughs> so I wonder, in all your years of, of hiring associates, is that like a good demark, like, you know, a good like... Um, uh, criteria to even look at it seems a bit discriminatory um, yeah um, I, 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 I think um, there is no one value you know of figure uh, that will identify you know a person um, so so um, whether a person comes from a, a tough background mm -hmm. or from a more privileged background is debatable you know how how he or she, what sort of contributions they can bring to a job. I think someone who comes from a tough background uh, may be toughened earlier on in life. 
but may actually come with certain prejudices um, or mindsets um, that may not be conducive, you know, mm. to a creative um, uh, view of things. Okay. Um, and someone who comes from a more privileged background is again hard, you know, to uh, sort of categorize, you know, mm. what this person might be. But, yes. but um, uh, who knows, you know, yeah. with um, more things and more mm -hmm. places that such a person have seen, more people that they may have met, mm -hmm. uh, they have um, horizons that are a bit broader, you know, in mm. terms of mindsets, in mm -hmm. terms of expectations. Yeah. yeah. So now looking back on your career, right, 30, 30 over years now, was there one role model who had an outsized impact on your life? Um, yeah, I've got role models, you know, uh, both um, in church life as well as uh, in my in my career. And I think in my career, um, there is no one person, but, but obviously um, there are people who practice the law uh, as gentlemen would, you know, and, and really treating opponents with respect and mm -hmm. of course the court with respect. Mm -hmm and your colleagues with, with mm. respect, um, there are those who are tough as nails, you mm. know. They don't speak the best English, you know, um, but they are tenacious. Yes. They will not let go of a point, you know. Um, and, and so I, 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 I catch different values, mm -hmm. different skills uh, from different people. And, okay. and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what's one piece of advice you give to lawyers who dream of one day becoming SC, like yourself? <laughs> I think it's good to dream, yes. all right? Um, and perhaps use that as a guiding principle or, um, or an objective or an aspiration that you want to have, but don't, don't, don't take it as mm. an all or nothing. Yes, right. like don't, if you don't get it, it doesn't mean you're not as a good litigator it, or a good it, lawyer. It, it doesn't mean that. Well, mm. I, I, I actually tried to convince myself of that, you know, after the first couple of applications that failed, you know, to say, I don't really need a senior counsel to define me as a person or even as a lawyer, you know. I guess if you want to be a senior counsel, it'd be great if, it, if, you, if, if, you, if you have it. But if you can prove yourself in every respect to be a senior counsel in how you speak, in how you approach your cases, in how you deal with the courts and with your opponents, and I think you are 70, 80% of the way there. All mm. that's missing are, are, are those initials. Yes. But you'll come your way when the time is right and mm. when you've got all of those values mm. in the right proportions in your life. Okay, great. And that ties in really nicely with actually the theme of season two, which is uh, the definition of success. Because at first you were saying, oh, I, I'm going to redefine uh, my definition of success. I don't need to be an SE when you first got rejected. So I'm going to ask what your definition of success now today comparing it to you know when you were maybe starting out as a lawyer how has that changed over the years well i i you know surely not be lying right if if i say that um you know having financial independence and you know just winning uh cases uh is not important i mean all that certainly is important um but you're going you, you're going to lose some cases mm -hmm. right you're just going to disappoint some clients. You're probably going to disappoint yourself, you know, um, uh, from time to time. Uh, make crazy, stupid arguments in court, you know, that when, when, when you go back and think about it, you just kick yourself, you know, why, why, why do I say something like this? Um, so you've got to bear all of that uh, in mind. But I guess what's important, um, at, at least at this stage of my life, you know, um, success, I think, will come hand in hand with the other S word, which is significance, mm. right? Um, I, I, I think uh, the thought that um, your presence or my presence, my participation means something to someone else. Mm. Um, that, I, I, I think, has become perhaps a more meaningful um, value or, or factor mm. in what I do these days. Well, I really love that. Mm. Significance. In fact, there's this book I've been reading from Success to significance. Mm, okay. How we define success, I'll share that with you. Okay. Uh, a friend actually shared that with me. Um, success means, when we were younger, the five C's, right? You know, what was it? Credit card, condo, country club. Well, I don't, I don't have all the five C's, but I, I do still feel successful. And like, for instance, just to share, success to me is a great relationship with my husband and my kids. 
That's mm. very important. And you have a fantastic relationship with your daughter and wife. I, I saw your daughter uh, yeah. the other day. Yeah. Grateful for that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So Vime, what's the way forward for you, the senior counsel? Wow, it's a loaded question, man, Shulin. Um, I think for the next few years, I will um, have to decide um, the proportion, you know, in terms of family, daughter is growing up, um, uh, church, uh, career, uh, and all of that is important. Um, and for myself, I suppose, um, is there any other things that I like to do? Is there another skill uh, that I, I, can, I can pick up? Mm -hmm. um, well, just to try to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing, I like to do a little bit more missionary work. I like to do a little bit more traveling. But all this conflicts with the very tight court schedule that I have. Um, so I'm at the mercy of my clients, at the mercy of my colleagues, at the mercy of the courts. So I'm asking, really, <laughs> for a bountiful harvest of mercy yes, yes. in the years to come. Yes, yes, yes. So I guess... It is very difficult when we ask this question. I get that because, I mean, if you ask me, it's difficult. But I think one thing you have is a very supportive team. I mean, look at Joseph and, and your colleagues. So I think you can take heart in that. But it does take a lot of intention to slowly move into possibly the next phase of your life or another career. Who knows? But Viming, I must say, I've been very touched by your open sharing. I just want to acknowledge you for being so open and, you know, talking about the cases. That, that, that was like, I, I mean, it really resonated with me. Well, I hope I'm not going to regret any of the things I said this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you won't. You were great. So I'm going to, before we wrap up the podcast, we usually dive a bit deeper and ask some quick questions, the rapid fire round. All Is right. Okay? Any multiple choices? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sure you can handle this. You've done cross-examination. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> so explain your morning routine in three words or, or maybe more if you need. Um, prayer and then the five greens. Oh. Uh, oh, for the last 10 years or so, my wife mixes this potent five greens uh, as a juice for me to just gulp down. I think it's capsicum, green apple, cucumber, celery, and be the god. Oh, wow. I must yeah. ask for the recipe because you yeah. look very youthful and you have a lot all of energy. Of now, yeah. once I consume that glass of concoction, I need not take any more vegetables or salads for the rest oh, of the yes, day with yes. a good conscience. Yes, uh, that's, that's true. That's, that's really the best thing. Actually, you know what? I've been doing that for the last six years. Oh, is that yes, right? Yes, but mine is coconut water, spinach, and kale, and wheatgrass. All yes, right, yes, maybe yes. I can try that. No, but, but yeah, I was <laughs> slightly different ingredients. Because the bitter god is the killer. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, Vimei, what is your favourite food haunt in Singapore? Oh, that's tough. You know, just uh, naming just one. If it's Italian, it is Valentino's at uh, Bukit Turf Club. If it is Japanese, well, there are lots of great Japanese restaurants. But our go-to place for just a normal Japanese meal is Wahiro mm. uh, in Katong. Yes, I've been there after oh, your you recommendation. Have? Oh, wow, it's great. It's great. Uh, friendly atmosphere, good food, yeah. fresh fish. Uh, and if it's Hokkien Mee, my favourite hawker stuff, uh, food fair, it will be Lorong 29 Gilang and that you find at the junction of Tulukurau Road and East Coast Road. Wow, amazing. Okay, everyone's taking down notes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Um, I think negative people and um, because they spread negative energy, uh, they dissipate enthusiasm um, and I think... Um, yeah, I, mm, I, I, I think agree. yeah, they, 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 they weigh down yes. you know, your enthusiasm. Like right? toxicity. Yeah. Right? Okay, next question. What motivates all your decisions? I, I, th um, I think firstly, I've got to be at peace with myself. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be what I think is right with God. Mm, okay, well said. If you weren't in law, what industry would you Medicine. be in? Medicine. Medicine. Medicine, okay. That was... I that can was see you being a doctor. Actually, that was what I thought I would be um, in, in primary school even. Oh. Yeah. Uh, my best friend in primary school, um, actually, I persuaded him to consider medicine. Oh, wow. Um, and, and he's now 
a top surgeon in Singapore, wow. uh, Dr. London Lucian Wee. Uh, uh, but along the way, I changed my mind and uh, went into law. But who knows? Yes. You know, it may be back into uh, the medical profession for me again. <laughs> <laughs> never okay. say never, Shulin. Yeah, never say never. <laughs> Morning person or midnight owl? More a midnight uh, owl. But it depends on what I'm looking at. Mm. Uh, in the morning, clear mind. Mm. At night, all the crazy ideas come into my mind. Yes, right? The yes. creative ideas yes. they all come in late at night. So if I have a crazy idea at night, I usually just keep it there. In the morning with a clearer mind, I go back to it and see whether it makes sense. Do you write it down or journal Sometimes it? I do. Yes. Yes. Mm -mm. I also have a lot of crazy ideas at like 1 a.m. Yes. <laughs> the worst ideas or the best ideas yes. come at night. Yes. So you need the morning to come before you know whether they are good or bad. Mm, good one. So what is the first thing that comes to mind when I say the word bar? Soap. Ah, <laughs> bar of soap. Well said. Thank you so much, Vivek, for coming on After the Bar. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you again for inviting me. I, I really had fun. I was really very touched, Viming, and I want to acknowledge you for being so open to share your stories. It's my pleasure. Your I, war stories. I, oh, uh, I hope they all make some sense. Of course they do. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of the listeners out there agree with me. This, this has been a great interview. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, it's always so much better when you look back at it, when you're going through that part of the journey. Some parts of it can be really tough. Yes, indeed. But look at how far you've come. I'm grateful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Viming. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, then be generous and share it with all of your friends. You can rate it, review it. Give us five stars on Spotify as well as Apple Podcasts. And you can follow me on LinkedIn. Tune in again next time to find out what's in store for you after the bar. Bye! Bye! Bye!